Well, now I realise I should have probably used the time to start the presentation. Apologies. Okay. So, my name is Eliana Jacke. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Inform Information Management at the University of Bremen. It's in the informatics department and also associated with the Center for Media Communication and Information Research. But my background is in computer science and STS, so not in communication studies or media studies, as many of you. What I'm going to present today is a European project that is ongoing. It's called Mobile Age. Um, it's got 10 partners from different European countries, and the aim really is to support and improve citizen access to public services and through participatory development of mobile technologies and the use of open data. And um, the main aim really um, in our role is to develop methods for effective involvement of um, older people in the creation <coughs> of new public services. And this is being done through a sort of <coughs> co-creation approach. So the idea really um, that um, we use participatory and inclusive um, research and innovation practices. So very much an action research project or research <coughs> creation, as I think it's um, called in Canada. Um, okay, so just um, for those uh, of you who are not familiar with the concept of um, open government data, this is data um, that can be uh, is defined as being, um, um, being freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone. And they're usually based on either Freedom of Information Acts or Transparency Acts. Um, within Europe, um, there is a digital European, um, or digital agenda for Europe that was um, published by the European Commission. And the idea really is that through open data, there will be economic gains. But what's more interesting um, for us and in the project is this idea that uh, societal challenges can be addressed by um, um, opening up data and allowing for um, innovative solutions to um, develop and by uh, fostering the participation of civil society actors um, and um, citizens. So there is this idea that through opening up data repositories, data and government will become more transparent and more accountable. Um, to um, their citizens. Um, around this um, idea of increased transparency and increased um, civic participation, there have been a number of initiatives which um, may be labeled under the umbrella of civic technology or participatory open data. And the idea really is that anybody who is willing to um, collaborate with others um, to build and invent open source solutions um, using publicly released data, code, and technologies to solve problems and challenges relevant to their neighborhoods, cities, or states. So the aim is to engage citizens, also with non-technical backgrounds, in practices relating to different levels of open data use. So um, Andrew Schrock has published a paper in 2016. He said it's actually different levels um, of um, open data use and open data engagement. So we are sort of requesting data to information, um, seeking and digesting, so using the data, to contributing or reusing open data, to the modeling and redistribution of data, and also to um, contesting, let's say, um, government data um, or data provided by the public administrations through the creation of own data and then uh, through the interpretation of that data. Okay, so there are a number of problems which have been um, described, for example, by Lee et al. That if one looks at the development of civic apps, so apps using, um, let's say, civil so uh, based, uh, developed by civil society actors based on open data, that there is a bias towards um, young and technology savvy citizens that are developing such apps, that the topics are mostly predefined and supply driven. So we hear about data-driven um, public sector innovation, etc. So it's mostly the data provided by public authorities um, and by government. So the scope of those um, civic apps mainly relates to um, infrastructure projects. So the topics relate to mobility, transport, and map-based um, reporting. And in many of those um, projects, citizens that are not very, um, let's say, technology savvy, nearly act as data collectors or sensors. So they're not really involved in the development of the design and the conceiving of um, concepts. So why is this a problem? 
The problem really is that if older adults are not active participants <coughs> um, of the design of open technologies or open data technologies, that um, what we can see is actually that particular social imaginaries about older adults and demographic aging are being reproduced in this very um, apps. So um, civic apps targeting older adults will, um, will very often, let's say, depict them um, as um, needy, as um, incapacit, um, there is a focus on the deficits and limitations of these older adults, and there are mainly um, dogged as um, ill health, um, neediness, yeah, needy and um, um, incapacit. Um, there is another, let's say, um, social imaginary or discourse around aging, which very much focuses on this fit and healthy, productive later life. So it's a, uh, it's a focus on the resources, but there's also an emphasis on um, staying young, um, staying mobile, and staying active, which is something that we had to come to realize in our project as well, um, that we are actually reinforcing this particular discourse. So it could also be seen in the name of the project, it's Mobile Age, so it's about getting people out and doing something and being active in later life. Um, Okay, so the challenge really is for civic app co-creation with older adults. Um, some of the questions that we ask in the project is, so how can non-technical citizens be active participants of open data co-creation activities? What methods will be employed or may be employed? What issues may emerge? What are challenges? And also, what is the role of researchers and other stakeholders? So if one takes an action research um, approach, what does it mean um, for us in our relation to um, the participants? Um, the focus in our specific field site, we have four field sites across Europe, so in Spain, in Greece, in the UK, and in Germany. So our focus in Bremen is on um, aging in place and understanding the socio-spatial dimension of um, aging in neighborhoods and of social inclusion. And this is just to give you some context about why it's important and what, what are the different dimensions and aspects that we are considering. So it's very important to think about the sense of attachment and social connection for older adults as they grow older in um, their neighborhoods. So this idea about knowing a neighborhood. There is um, also, um, what's also important is this idea and sense of um, security and familiar familiarity. So knowing where to find relevant information and resources and the sense of identity, which is also linked to um, independence and autonomy. So to know where organizations and places are located, which services are provided, and how to access them. Um, just to um, settle this and round that a bit in, in the theory of where we are coming from and how we are thinking about data, data practices, and also data creation, I think this is something that everybody um, agrees here in the room and at the conference that data do not just exist via the um, data provided by government and authorities or data that um, citizens um, have produced but rather data are generated and what Gittleman and Jackson say in their introduction is that data need to be imagined as data um, to exist and function as such and the Im imagination of data always inter entails an interpretive space so from a process perspective, really, data help to frame a phenomenon by demarcating um, boundaries in space and time. So for example, when one thinks about age-friendly environments and the ways in which data represent those, then this elicits particular social imaginaries about what it means to become um, old age and in particular um, aging in um, urban spaces. Um, we are also um, um, basing what we are doing theoretically on um, Karen Barat's work and the um, idea of interaction. So really that the subjects and the objects do not pre-exist the interaction, so that, um, and that they're not independent entities, but rather that they are produced through performing associations. So that the data and the participants, for example, as such do not um, pre-exist um, um, our, um, our project and our intervention, but rather that through, um, through the intervention and through the um, co-creation activities, particular um, subject and objects are being produced. And quite helpful is Lucy Suchman's idea about the or notion of socio-material reconfigurations, 
which help to draw the attention to the imaginaries and materialities that um, technology is trying to gather. So really to see technologies and data in particular is something that um, helps you to understand particular social imaginaries and how they play out. Okay, so some questions that I want to um, raise today are really what do data tell us about the social imaginaries of aging and of social inclusion and how does this interaction with data changes the ways in which the participants and researchers understand aging and place. Um, these are some pictures of the district in Bremen where we um, undertook um, the first um, set of field work. So we're in the middle, we're just starting a second phase. Um, so it's all still very preliminary. What you can see, it's quite a diverse um, district. So the um, unemployment rate is a bit higher than in the rest of the city. Um, there is a high population of people with a migration background. But what you can also see is that it's not just these multi-story um, buildings, but you have um, single houses, single detached houses. It's quite a bit of um, green area um, and spaces. Um, but still, the, the, the district itself, uh, within, let's say, the city is actually depicted as one that needs support. And a lot of, actually, structural funds have been given to that um, to the district. OK. So what I will be doing now is to talk a bit about how we actually undertook um, the co-creation activities in the district, um, what kind of app we developed, um, and then um, come back to um, some of the questions that I initially asked. So um, what we drew upon um, was um, Bill Gavers um, and others' work on cultural probes. I don't know whether you're familiar with that. But the idea is that um, since you can't um, observe the everyday life of your participants um, all the time, you um, ask them to um, basically document um, their um, use practices of, for example, digital media and their um, everyday activities. So what our citizens, uh, our participants um, got from us was uh, each of them got a little bag and in those bags, there were, for example, um, a diary where they noted down what they did um, every day in the district with whom, the, uh, with whom they communicated. We had a map here which, in which they um, um, marked where they live, where friends and families live, where important places and spaces are for them, which parts of the district they like and they don't like. We had here, there were seven different maps where we asked them to actually put their mobility pattern down. Um, and we gave them a camera um, where we asked them to take pictures um, of the districts of parts that they like and um, don't like and that are important for their, let's say, um, everyday life. So the idea was really through those cultural probes to establish the participants as experts about their neighborhood, but as also as experts of aging in that place. And that was quite important for us because in the beginning there was this, um, there was this um, well not tension, but this feeling that the uh, participants weren't quite sure what they could actually contribute to the project, is they were not as technology savvy as they might have wished for, or some of them didn't use any digital technology at all. So it really helped um, to, um, to establish them in the process as experts of their own right. Um, what we did when, um, so this is one example of the probes and how we started to interpret and work with them. When they returned the, um, the maps, we put them all up together and started to look at um, this, let's say, social spatial dimension of inclusion. So how do people actually relate to others within the district? What are the mobility patterns? And what we subsequently did was to conduct a workshop with the participants where we put up all those maps and then ask them what are actually the differences and similarities that matter to you? Why do you think that the maps are so different? And what is it that makes them different? And what is important and not? So based on these, um, let's say, characteristics that we um, jointly defined um, with the participants, we develop personas, so these here. Personas are a standard, let's say, software development tool. Usually software developers will describe prototypical users um, for them to then start developing use case scenarios. The problem really 
<laughs> the problem really is that uh, very often those um, uh, personas are very stereotypical about what they think um, the users will be. So in a way, these personas help to ground the future users within the group of people that were actually participating in the co-creation activities. They also helped us, because we did then and subsequently an exercise to think about what are actually the information needs and the resources of the participants. They also helped us to um, facilitate the discussion about these information needs. So for example, it was much easier for people to talk about, let's say, a persona that had financial constraints or that was lonely or that had a particular, let's say, um, um, requirement. Um, okay, yeah. Very important then after these information needs were um, gathered was the defining of object categories and attributes. So whereas in a lot of um, map-based projects you start off with whatever um, data is available um, from um, the open government repositories, the idea here really was to think about what kind of objects are actually important and of interest and what are the specific attributes. So it's not just about a specific um, um, category such as a nice place or um, a walk, but what are the attributes that um, mark that space as interesting and as important. So what is relevant for um, the senior citizens. What we also did, but I'm not going to talk about that more, is um, we did some co-designing and paper prototyping um, based on scenarios that were developed on the personas. Um, we did map co-design, so how should the map look like, what's important for the map. And what we then did, because <laughs> that was something that we had to realize, is that, sh that actually a lot of the data that they were interested in wasn't actually available, and a lot of the attributes that they thought were relevant wasn't available either. So a big chunk of the work that we did with the, um, with the participants was then to actually create data. So we started off with um, these big tables, we had a number of them, printed them out because, as I said, some of the participants don't use the computer and then slowly, slowly filled them in and at some point had a digital version. Um, and the participants are really active in filling those in, but also taking photographs and pictures about the places and spaces they deemed um, relevant. And then in the end, obviously, there was um, a part where we evaluated the uh, process as well as the outcome. I'm going to skip the video in which one of the um, um, participants is explaining what to do. Just show you, this is the entry, um, basically the first start page, where we have different um, categories, and so nice places, culture, um, consulting, um, sports. And when you click on them, you can actually get to a map in which you can find different nice places. You have, um, you have a short description, um, and then you can have a list view. And then if you click on it, you can actually get a description of the nice places with the various attributes that people were interested in. So for example, toilets, lightning, um, <coughs> sports, and whether you can <coughs> sit there or not, whether there are benches, etc. Um, why was that important? It's really important for people to feel, as I said, safe and confident to know about, to feel like this um, feeling of um, security and to move confidently within the neighborhood. So what this somehow allows um, people is to plan, when, you know, plan um, a trip or a walk um, when they go out, and it just um, increases this feeling of um, confidence and um, security also. Um, there's a really um, a nice book that I came just recently across on the city as an interface from uh, Martin de Waal. And um, I think what quite helps us in understanding what the Digital Neighborhood Guide may mean for um, the participants and people living in this district is that on the one hand, it's an experience marker. So it can be used to record um, the urban experiences, memories and stories and share them with others in particular when considering who these others may be and that this public is, for example, um, an aging population or other older adults in the district. But it can also be used as a territory device. So it um, markates a particular, let's say, spa space in an ur urban environment and it somehow also changes the experience of that location because suddenly the participants became aware that particular aspects within um, let's say, uh, in a space place 
were of importance. <coughs> okay. Um, so the local knowledge really that is built up in this way is not only a source of practical information, but it's also a shared world of experience that plays a big role in binding a public together. So if one thinks about the public as being all the adults living in that district, it really helps them to, under, uh, to develop that, uh, let's say, um, shared um, world of experience, uh, the district, as um, they um, grow older. And the focus in such activities, um, we think, really changes um, from visualizing objects on a map to visualizing um, participants' placemaking practices. And as it, as it is a reflective practice, it also um, starts processing um, or reflects about aging rather than um, thinking about um, what it means to be old. So what does it mean to age in um, a city, in this particular district? Um, what does it mean to age with place and in the place? What does it mean to actually lead a fulfilling life um, in relation to aging? So um, some of the participants, um, for example, then started to um, explore the district in different ways because they hadn't been to particular parts since they were a bit stigmatized. And also what participants started to reflect upon was the role of technology as either enabling or assistive or disruptive. Um, and I think what co-creation also helps to do is to value the experience of different types um, of embodied and cultured and situated knowledge so that the uh, older adults really feel um, as if, yeah, that they are contributing um, um, to their communities in other ways, which is something that they do anyway. So a lot of older adults will actually be um, very active within their communities and a lot of them to um, do charity work. So it just extends the possibilities that they have to also create these, um, let's say, um, digital <coughs> spaces. So just to conclude, I think, what we've been trying to do with the project was through this data co-creation um, to help citizens also contest particular social imageries of aging and of old age. So um, just contesting the use of um, the data that is there and available and use, usually used to just um, support, let's say, um, particular ways of depicting them. And it's also a reflective practice to position oneself in relation to spatial data um, and to reconfigure oneself's, um, let's say, subjectivity in that sense. So to just take agency in interpreting a particular data regime and contesting them. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you all for coming to the very last paper of the very last session <laughs> at the end of the conference um, and thanks for staying around um, so I am going to talk I've changed the title obviously because um, I've been really interested in uh, thinking about the possibility of um, employing concepts of solidarity in relation to some of the dilemmas um, that I'm going to identify in relation to data citizenship so I'm going to talk about the experience of living <coughs> under datification and the possibility of using data for civic action. Um, so when I talk about data citizenship, I'm talking about the possibility for people to act in ways that um, change or enhance or engage with the places that they live. Um, and my field sites are all um, conceptual. They're all ideas about smart cities and places where smart cities have been um, attempted to be repositioned as smart um, cities for citizens. So I'm going to have to start with the idea of the promise of the smart city. I'm then going to have to take apart the promise of the smart city. And then I'm going to present ways that people have thought about the smart city differently. Um, and I'm going to present a little example of a case where people have, have tried to think about the smart city differently, um, which is going to connect very nicely with Juliana's um, uh, project, because I think it's, uh, it's got some similar conceptual underpinnings. And then I'm going to present um, how different actions to think about the smart city differently do different critical work. What kinds of critique are possible of the smart city from a citizen perspective? So that's a general outline of, um, of where I'm going. Um, 
And so citizenship, in my formulation, isn't belonging to a national state. It's not even really good citizenship, although sometimes we'll talk a little bit about like what is good citizenship in a smart city. Um, but it's really this sort of notion of an active citizenship that gives a potential to act. Um, and I'm interested in the shift in the smart city from a smart city that is based on the idea of providing extra access to information resources to the idea of a smart city that is based on um, data extraction, computation, and the, de the, and the promise of greater efficiency, either in the delivery of public services or in other aspects of the operation of the city. So I'm thinking about a particular kind of citizenship and a particular kind of data city. So I'm thinking about data as information produced by or significant for these kinds of acts of citizenship. So this could be trace data of transactions, this could be G, um, location data based on people moving around in places, or it could be um, data from environmental sensors. Um, but this is all stuff that makes the smart city work, right? The smart city is this kind of rhetorical promise of um, a um, computation of, of a, of a um, technologically enabled space with an improved experience of life. And this talk is from a book project that I'm working on. And the book talks about different kinds of smart cities over time. Um, because of course the smart city is not a new concept, it's been around for a very long time. And the kind of information society smart cities date at least from the, you know, 20 years ago, if not um, earlier. So these information society smart cities first were kind of based on the idea of expanding internet access to people and expanding access to information to enable a kind of good um, and participatory citizenship in the use of information. But what's happened now, as we've moved from that, is that we now have the smart open data smart city. And this is quite a different beast because the smart open data city draws on the possibility of using data to structure new relationships between the people who live in cities, the people I think of as potentially being able to be citizens, and the governments who run those cities. So in lots of smart cities, data is a resource, right? It's a kind of resource that is extracted from the physical space of the city, from the um, you know, no mobile phone data of its citizens, from the tapping in and tapping out on RFID-enabled transit systems to be able to kind of better understand and manage the, uh, the, the, the city as a system. And there's a great amount of literature on the movement of the city to, as, a, uh, as a system from uh, Orit Halpern's um, uh, kind of history of the, controls, uh, of the control center to um, Rob Kitchen's discussion of smart cities as data assemblages. Um, but I'm really interested in how this impacts on what kinds of things people can do with information, because this is a very different political economic space than the smart city based on action. So how do the power dynamics work for data as a form of communication power in <coughs> this kind of smart city? If we're thinking about power dynamics in terms of um, data being a form of government, data used to govern, um, data as a form of governance, or data as a form of governmentality in the kind of Foucauldian sense. So the promised vision and the kind of way that power is set up in this smart city is that every entity, that an increased number of entities in these sort of um, uh, smart open data cities produce data. But my question has always been, who and where and how does it get processed? Because the smart open data city is not a city in which the uh, information about the um, function of the city is kept within the, um, the, the places where, where governance decisions are made. It is entirely dependent on a process of extracting data, moving it, having it processed in the cloud, and having analytics and insights returned to the city. So the smart open data city is, an, is also a process in the cloud city. And database smart cities then separate administrative and operational processes. They collect lots and lots of data 
from people, let's say citizens, and in another part of this argument I argue that like the sort of ideal good citizen in this kind of smart city is one who just produces data, who um, accepts that their existence in the city is an implicit consent to have data collected about them all the time in exchange for a more optimal experience, and that governments also accept that they, that, um, that they can reduce costs, provide more effective services, and um, reduce risks by, um, making, by increasing the, the um, number of database decisions they make. But this depends on relying on third-party analytics providers. Um, and there are many of them. I, anal I w did a review of 100 smart city analytics providers um, who uh, promise to do this kind of processing in the cloud. And from in a political economic sense, what these processes do is they remove the, in the, the actual analytic information about what's happening in a city from the control of either the citizen or the local government, because that's going to Axiom or it's going to any of these other off-site um, uh, third-party uh, brokers. So citizen, techno-citizens here are kind of remade. Open data makes corporate brokerage easier. It opens up this kind of space for the analytic company to actually know what's going on and then to sell the knowledge of what's going on back to the, to the, to the city government. Um, if you think about large technology companies as also having a secondary um, uh, long-term business proposition, which is to more effectively train artificial intelligence agents, the fact that much data about all kinds of aspects of everyday lives in cities is extracted from the place that it's produced, um, passed over to third-party analytics companies, and only the analytics come back, you might start, like me, to get a little concerned about the kind of um, amassing of this uh, increasingly large amount of data um, within the control of third-party analytics companies. Um, so this is a kind of, uh, but I think of this as a structural thing. So I'm going to talk about the structure and what the structure implies for civic action. Because resistance to this is very difficult to um, produce. And arguably, it's actually not resistance that we make. Because what are we going to do? Go, I resist. I am throwing my GPS-enabled smartphone in the gar garbage, and I am never going to use a location-enabled map. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So resistance is not the logic. This is not a, lo this is not a power dynamic that, that invites resistance. So it must invite other things. My argument is that this kind of um, you know, platform version of the smart open data city invites participation through a variety of different means. It invites participation, for example, in the kinds of open data actions that um, Julianne just described and that Andrew Schrock describes in his work. But there are some problems. Process in the cloud removes local oversight. It removes the ability to calculate data locally, to contextualize it locally. And it also removes some other things that are pretty fun about being a citizen of a particular place, like fun, engagement, and, I argue, struggle. And I'm going to come back to that. So open data movements and open data advocacy are one kind of challenge to this. But they're not a challenge that really takes aim at this entire structure. They're a challenge that works epistemologically within this structure. You, we can say open data movements challenge the kind of knowledge that's made um, either by governments or by analytics companies by doing a different kind of analysis of whatever data is enabled. But they don't challenge this separation of administration of the data, which is the decision making that is happening in the cloud, from the operationalization, the actual actions that, that, uh, that governments are taking with the new analytics they have. For example, and these, uh, these are really banal. There are things like you know, we've analyzed like how many bins need to be picked up, um, you know, on a particular route, and we think you should do them in this order. So I'm really wondering how far open data can go. Um, but I'm also inspired by projects that do a kind of operational critique. So to illustrate, I'm sure many of you have heard about um, 596 Acres, um, which started in Brooklyn and is now expanded into a very large project. 
Um, this is a very interesting project because um, it introduces a critique of what open data is supposed to be. So this project took open data on vacant lots in across um, uh, the boroughs of Manhattan and Brooklyn and used the open data to identify places that people might want to do um, situationally based community projects like community gardens. They also opened up the, um, they also kind of created um, places for people to discuss what to do with vacant, underused, or yet to be sold land. So I think it's an interesting project, not because people looked at the open data, but because they created a different sort of process um, uh, around the data and a different kind um, of meaning. So the, the community processed the data into space and public engagement, and it created friction in relation to the way that the data was originally meant to be used and indeed to the way that it was defined, which was actually like um, identifications of particular coordinates where, where, where land was used in a particular way. So the information was not meant to be used for the purpose that it was collected for, and so it was transformed and processed in a different way. And so 596 Acres and some of the interviews that I did with open data advocates for my book project started me thinking about what kinds of critique um, might be possible in the smart open data um, framework. So this is all work in progress. This is the very first time I've talked about any of this. So here is my <laughs> like little sketch um, of some of the different ways that I think maybe people are engaging in different forms of critique in relation to this particular formulation of the smart city, which otherwise really prescribes civic action. You know, open data advocacy in some ways just reinforces the idea of making government, using government as a platform, which came from Tim O'Reilly. It's a very specific model from Silicon Valley. So what else could you possibly do? So we have database decision making and outsourcing of um, uh, of the analytic decision making, which creates the separation between the administrative, what you actually know about the function of the city, and the operation, what is actually happening. And so citizens can maybe get in between here in different ways. So I think you could do, you can you can look at, at the many ways that open data advocacy makes an epistemological critique. But I'm also increasingly interested in the ways that building data commons which in some ways is what 596 Acres done, has done, um, might create a kind of ontological critique. Because making a data commons, holding data together, like maintaining something that's a collective resource, messes up this idea of removing the data to make an analytic decision elsewhere. Um, and the, the sort of third um, uh, aspect of critique that I started to, to, to think about was, where can we find an ethical critique of this? So you can have a data commons, but under what circumstances does a data commons or the production of a data commons um, acquire the possibility to make an ethical critique of all of this? Because if you're starting to feel as freaked out as I am about the removal of power and agency from the institutions of government and from the, from, and re the removal of all processes of participation from people, then you have probably concluded that some kind of ethical critique is necessary. So I started looking at my empirical um, evidence and what I was thinking about working through for the book, and I realized that one of the cases that I had been following perhaps gave me a, a sense of the direction for an ethical critique. Um, and this is, this is a project that I've been following but that I didn't lead, and it's called the Bristol approach, and it's, a, it's a, um, an EU-funded project um, uh, which was undertaken by the Knoll West Media Center and a uh, consultancy called Ideas for Change to do a participatory sensing project in the city of Bristol. And in many ways, this is very similar to the project we just heard about because it was funded by the same program within the European Union. And this program was a funding project um, that were pr particularly oriented towards this co-construction approach. So this is a kind of framework that is now becoming very 
significant um, within the kind of high-level European policy space. We want to have our smart cities co-created. We want to have citizen-based smart cities. So they have had, a, for over the last couple of years, there have been numerous projects funded across Europe that have in, employed participatory methods and co-construction of technology and of knowledge in order to try to rearrange the power dynamics of the smart city. So I um, decided to assess a number of these as part of my research. I was interested in where these projects came from, who was involved in them, what the relationships were between the project partners, and what um, kinds of, uh, of discussions they had as they went through. So with the support of, um, of the participants in the um, Bristol Approach Sensing Project, I went and interviewed everybody in Bristol who was involved in this project to try to figure out what made it um, uh, interesting to them and what kinds of things were actually produced. And um, what I, the reason I decided to look at this project was I was very interested in the potential of the commons. And this project identified the production of a city commons as the main goal of the project. And the city commons they identified as a process of participation and relationship construction across a number of people within a city in order to address a shared matter of concern. So their process was quite similar to the one that you just heard about. They used um, a kind of uh, like local walking tour uh, with residents of Noel West, which is an underprivileged neighborhood outside of Bristol, um, which also contains the Noel West Media Center, who, who actually came up with this project idea and hired the consultant. So this is a, a, a European project that was instigated by a radical media center who has been doing radical local media and citizen media training for 20 years. And they used the EU project funding to try to figure out how to teach the people in their neighborhood about sensor technology. So they said, great, we'll hire this consultant, we'll do a participatory sensing project, but we're gonna try to make a commons. Um, and so that was going to be the, the, the sort of goal of their project. And after all of the participatory design, they, focus, they decided to focus on an issue of concern in the local area, which is that houses are really damp. Lots of people live in local council rented housing. Damp is a real problem. People have breathing problems. But they also have a problem because they used to have a, a city of Bristol damp inspector who would come by and like look to see if their house actually was damp according to the regulatory guidelines on, on like bad forms of damp and black mold. But that person's job no longer exists. So they have a kind of gap. They have a legitimacy gap. So what they decided to do was to create a kind of sensor that would be a humidity sensor. And they would collect data from this humidity sensor. And they would use this data to create a kind of civic commons of data about places that the sensor showed had high humidity, places that had been previously reported as having bad damp, um, postal code, uh, um, uh, council data on which type of tenancy people had in the area. And they would use this to kind of um, have data hackathon discussions um, in order to figure out how to solve this problem. And it was a wildly successful project. They built these really cute little damp sensors that are frog shaped um, during some of their hackathons. Um, and uh, and they, uh, there was a, such incredible interest in the uh, rollout of these damp frog sensors that one of the people who lived in the local community decided that he was going to come up with a business idea to build these Arduino-based frog sensors and sell them to all of the neighbors in his area. But given that the project was actually trying to build a data commons, this very quickly became <laughs> an issue of tension um, among the project participants. And the city of Bristol also had lots of different difficult um, conversations within the city government because they couldn't figure out how to use this kind of um, frog sensor data. Um, you know, Jennifer Gabriz has this idea that the, the sort of good enough data creates a political conversation. The data doesn't have to be that good in order to spark the political conversation. But actually, the data was, was sort of n not, like no one quite knew exactly what it was. The city of Bristol knew that they wanted to have a data commons, but they couldn't figure out whether it was going to have frog data, plus their ordinance survey data, plus what other data were they supposed to put in, and who was going to get it. 
and how is this all going to fit together? Um, and I interviewed um, the consultant, and uh, and she said, well, this this was we were they were really excited because the European Union was so excited that somebody was gonna was gonna base an entrepreneurial business idea on the results of an EU, of an EU funded project, but. The project was to create a data commons, and the business idea was totally antithetical to the notion of a data commons, because the business model was going to be you try to pay the price of transparency. So you pay like 10.99 if you as the landlord only keep the data, but you pay five or 4.99 if you share the data with the tenants. So there were already these kind of really complicated um, questions that they had about who is the commons for, how do you make the sensing data political? The insiders and the outsiders, the um, potential for governing a commons, and I, st I started to find this incredibly interesting. And at the same time, I've been think I had been thinking about solidarity as a principle for data governance. And the bioethicists, um, Barbara Prainsek and Alina Buyix, have written a very nice book about so principles of solidarity in data governance. And they argue that, a that you can govern a data commons with principles of solidarity. These principles of solidarity need to account for the fact that we have the imaginative ability to see strange people as fellow sufferers, that we have the ability to see other people as people who might need information that we have, th that we have given to solve a, a, uh, their own problem or to solve a collective problem. And they argue that that um, solidarity needs to accommodate individual risks, but that institutions and individuals accept costs in order to support others. And they also say that if you are really going to govern with a principle of solidarity, you concede that sort of uh, the, the, the kind of judgment of solidarity to a trusted intermediary. And I thought, well, this is very good, but I think something else is happening here. I think that solidarity is not, can not only be at the point where the data commons is produced and needs to be governed, I think that in, the ca in cases as in Bristol, that solidarity is produced through the attempt to build a collective resource. And in part, that solidarity is produced in the, in the points of friction between the different <coughs> perspectives that people have and the, and the negotiation that they need to make in order to accommodate one another. Um, Bristol was an interesting site for me because of its 20-year history in doing radical media advocacy and because of the relationships that were already there before the sensing project came in to actually produce discussions between the city <coughs> government, a radical media organization, people on the ground, um, experts uh, you know, with, with, with particular um, expertise who were coming in, um, artists and, um, you know, and students who were, who were studying data science. So my argument is that, that, that we might start thinking about solidarity in both of these ways, in relation to data and relation to commons, as a way of pushing back against that kind of um, political economic situation that I described at the beginning. Um, and I think we could think about the production of solidarity as this ethical critique and part of this ethical move towards data sovereignty. So can, to conclude, you know, data, we, we need to consciously choose to participate in solidaristic governance. And this isn't without friction and difference, but it anticipates justice as a principle. And I think we should, as scholars, be able to imaginatively um, see, um, see, see processes where the commons could be produced in a solidaristic manner. Um, and so sort of the example that I just talked through shows how existing relationships of both connection and friction um, might be ways of producing an action of solidarity. So thank you. Mm -hmm.